Sun on Sound took a rare opportunity to talk in depth with legendary audio equipment designer Rupert Neve, who at the age of 89 is still designing high-end studio equipment. We opened by asking Rupert about the origin of his world-renowned EQ designs. We were talking about um, how to change the balance in a recording. Bearing in mind that it was all mono, um, it's unthinkable in today's context, but um, um, you literally had perhaps three or four microphones at the most feeding into a very simple mixer. And uh, the only EQs available in those days were things like the Pultic, an excellent piece of gear, but very, very gentle uh, curves, very low Q and so on. And affecting the overall um, picture, if you like, but not any kind of surgical importance to what it was doing. And uh, um, you bring a bunch of musicians in and make a recording and they find that the guitar is kind of lost. So what do you do? You bring all the musicians in again, um, scouring the various nightclubs and so on into which they've all disappeared over the last week, get them all together again and re-record. Very expensive, difficult. Is there any way we can change that mix? Well, EQ occurred to me and I found that the guitar, they, they gave me a tape and had a surprisingly restricted range of frequencies. And so I developed a very high Q um, equalizer circuit, um, which was around uh, somewhere in the region of 2000 cycles. And um, you could swing it a little bit this way and that way. And it would actually home in on the fundamentals of the guitar. What it did to the harmonics is a different story, but uh, um, and you, with, with a, another different equaliser, you could play around with the overall picture and actually recover quite a decent signal from the whole thing. So we uh, managed to do that and they liked it. The interesting thing to me where I started on quality, I, I was always a quality fiend, if you like, and uh, <coughs> um, so the amplifiers into which this EQ was embedded were all, well, needless to say, they were class A because there were no ICs in those days. And so every circuit was single-sided. This was uh, transistors, by the way, not tubes. Inputs and outputs were transformers. I simply didn't know any other way. I'd grown up with tubes. Now, tubes have some hundreds of volts on their plates. You can't simply, uh, and the authorities wouldn't let you put a capacitor from a high, uh, the output of a, of a plate circuit into a landline. Um, <clears throat> it capacitor fails and you've got deaths, people falling about you dead with the electric shock. No, it can't be done. Transformer is the obvious way. And I had already, in uh, previous jobs that I'd had, developed high-quality tube amplifiers, audio amplifiers. Um, it was a few steps to turn them into um, transistor designs. Still, transformers seem to me to be the only sensible way of interfacing with the outside world. Well, when we first tried these equalizers at Philips Records, um, their first concern was is the basic amplifier good enough? All this was on Tuchel German connectors, which meant you could jack in the input and output circuits simultaneously. So they set everything flat, and they played tapes that they were familiar with, and they spent the afternoon jacking in and out, in and out, listen, 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 in circuit, out of circuit, in circuit, out of circuit. And finally, Mick Moriarty, who was golden-eared, um, engineer at the time, he said, you know, he said, I hate to admit it, but I think it actually sounds better with that amplifier switched in. <laughs> so, now, there's all kinds of theories as to why it sounded better. 
first of all, um, you are eliminating all kinds of um, background stuff which um, is inherent in many systems. They were jacking this circuit in and out of a studio complex which went through probably two or three different patch fields, uh, power amplifiers, um, the source was a tape machine, and by the time you've added in the source impedances, the load impedances, and so on and so forth, and when it came to the transformers that I had introduced, um, I knew, although I say it with some <laughs> arrogance, I knew what I was doing when it came to transformers. It was my subject. And I think it was a matter of interfacing with their system uh, rather than any specific quality that the uh, amplifier itself had, although it was a good amplifier. When they started to apply the EQ and found that it actually did help them to change the ratio of the guitar in the mix, and they could make other adjustments too over the rest of the frequency range. Um, I was, you know, home and dry on that one. That was the origin, I suppose, of the EQ. So what are the characteristics that make a truly great equaliser circuit? An equaliser should have no, ideally, should have no distortion of its own. Um, it's almost impossible to, to do it without some distortion, but that's the aim. So if you can do that, now there are a lot of equalizers about where people have just taken um, a circuit out of some reference book and hope for the best. Um, and they've never really succeeded because they haven't taken account of all these other things. Specifically, the EQ circuit has got to have a certain Q. If if you if you make it too, if you make the sides of the curve too steep, it's going to spoil the sound of the musical instruments that are within the bell. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if it's not steep enough it's not going to be very effective. So it's a matter of judgment, of listening and listening and listening to um, try and achieve something that sounds acceptable and to begin to understand what it's actually doing to the um, harmonics. For some reason, if you were to enhance the harmonic structure such that you've got a lot of fifth and seventh, which is an absolute sour no-no. Um, <clears throat> it's not going to sound sweet, whatever the opposite of is, you know, bitter, horrible. Um, so it's a question of listening, understanding why it sounds the way it does, and then pursuing a particular direction to make it sound that much better, avoiding the very high order harmonics. Um, the shelving filter, which um, is controllable in terms of its amplitude and its turnover frequency, um, you've got to have uh, enough of the curve which is approximating or e equal to about 3 dB per octave. If it's not uh, achieving that degree of steepness, it's not um, an equalizer. It's, it's, it's a tone control, if you like. It's sort of changing the overall balance somewhat. In order to provide a reasonable uh, range of frequencies over which this 3 dB or 3.5 dB per octave applies. Um, the departure point from flat to where the curve starts takes a dip. It's slightly cheating, as it were, so that uh, you look at these curves, you'll find there's, there's a dip just uh, where there's 
effect starts and then it goes on up to and exceeding uh, 3dB per octave and uh, if it's a shelving curve it'll flatten off. Um, <clears throat> so it's really a question of squeezing as much as you can from the um, uh, the, 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 the frequency of where you're starting the EQ process to the point where you're finishing it. That is if you really want to apply maximum EQ. Of course you don't always want to apply maximum EQ, sometimes it's the very gentlest of, uh, of slopes that you need. Nearly every IC is itself a push-pull amplifier containing an element of crossover distortion. So if you can avoid that or use the IC in a way that crossover distortion is not obtrusive. Um, that's the first thing that I listen for. And um, <clears throat> then uh, the easiest way of avoiding crossover distortion is to make it all single-sided. So by definition, it's, there's no crossover. Um, and then, of course, you've got various other forms of distortion which come in. And you can hear these mechanisms beginning to work. Um, and when um, you're satisfied with the sound, that it's a musical sound, from a personal point of view, I'll sit back and relax. And I, I do mean relax. If I can't relax, the thing isn't right. Being known as he is for designing high-end analog circuitry, we wanted to know what Rupert thought about using ICs or integrated circuits. After I sold the old Neve company, there was a huge movement to convince the new owners that my designs were over the hill and there were much better ways of doing it. Now these integrated circuits had appeared on the scene so much smaller, so much more efficient, so much cheaper. And the consoles from that time, that was sort of mid-70s onwards, started to lose that precious something because of the insistence of uh, introducing these technologies. At the end of the day, it, it, it's, it's musical. It comes to a gut feeling that this isn't the way to go. You try it, it doesn't sound right, not going to do it. The op amp is the heart of the amplifier. The consoles that we currently manufacture um, make use of op amps, but op amps of our own design. They are discrete op amps, if you like. They had to perform in every way better than the best IC that you can find and avoid the artifacts of crossover distortion, of slew rate distortion and, um, and related to that of course is the bandwidth. Um, <clears throat> we examined every possible use of existing uh, integrated circuits because the advantages are so obvious if you could use them, but the more we delved into it, the more we realized that we couldn't. So we come into the mic pre, um, and that, uh, the first thing the signal encounters is a, a really nice op-amp. Um, <clears throat> That op-amp doesn't have to do much in the way of feeding any power to anywhere. It's got to feed a voltage into circuits, sometimes quite a lot of cabling involved. Um, a big console has got a lot of wire in it. And um, <clears throat> so you route your uh, signal in the most efficient way that you can um, to um, possibly an equalizer circuit or a series of equalizer circuits. And now your op amp has got to adopt um, a format which is going to is going to operate happily in the context of equalizer circuits, capacitors, sometimes inductors, 
which uh, you're folding around it. So it's got to be capable of feeding that kind of circuit. Again, it's not a power thing, but it's because uh, an amplifier doesn't know the difference between power and volt amps, but it's got to be able to feed the requisite number of volt amps into the equalizer section. You then go into your mix bus, and again, same sort of thing. You've got to study what is it expected to do, what it's going to feed, and <clears throat> how many inputs is that bus going to have to deal with, and so on. So every stage, there are marginal differences to um, an op amp, which um, is designed for you know for that particular area. The output end is a transformer. Transformers have these amazing advantages of galvanic isolation and um, the fact that you can choose the impedances that you want them to work between. Um, and um, I'm um, sort of almost born and bred into transformers, so I find it very difficult to be completely objective about transformers. So what exactly is it that transformers provide which electronically balanced interfaces don't? Uh, there is a sound element to it, um, largely the isolation. The fact that you can run um, a line uh, over many hundreds of feet, meters, um, and <clears throat> the transformer will, the transformer has leakage inductance. Your line has capacitance, principally. It has some inductance as well. But um, if you put a line, a long line, and an output transformer together, you've got a resonance. Um, and the resonance will depend more on the length of line than anything else. Um, so there is a limit. Now, you say, well, why use a transformer? Because the fact of a dB and a half or whatever of resonance in a long line plus transformer is a sweet and musical sound. If you use an amplifier directly without a transformer, the capacitance of that line will cause the amplifier to slew and will give you distortion of a very undesirable, it's not musical, so that is really the essence of why a transformer in most practical applications is better than a direct output from, an, uh, from, a, uh, uh, from a transistor or from a, an IC. Of course, Rupert hasn't stopped designing new circuitry and one of the latest additions to his products is the silk circuit. The equaliser um, not only was capable of subtly changing the relationship of, say, a guitar to other instruments, which is a fairly uh, heavy um, use of uh, an equaliser, but you can play around for the sake of trying to describe what happens um, with an equaliser in a very subtle way and produce a sound which you prefer to the totally flat frequency response. Now this is musical preferences, this is down to the actual um, sound engineer who will play with the sound. It's to do with the microphone, it's to do with the acoustics of the room and quite a number of other factors. And <clears throat> um, I found that in general terms, some increase 
in second harmonic and some increase in third harmonic, and we're talking quite subtle amounts, um, actually sound better than complete elimination of those harmonics. So the silk circuit does give you um, the ability to introduce... It's, it's, it's not that it's um, a huge amount of equalization, it's very subtle equalization, but it changes the harmonic structure uh, at the mid and low frequencies. And that is something which is very, very hard to explain in words. You just listen to it and say, yeah, I think I like that better. Technology has changed a lot in the time that Rupert's been designing circuitry. How does he feel about digital modelling, for example? So everything has become much more compact. Um, everything is much more efficient. Components are smaller, better quality for the most part, more reliable. And you can do things today which would have been very difficult to do 30 years ago. Uh, we've been working with um, a certain company um, that has produced some really excellent uh, models and um, it is very hard indeed to tell one from the other. If I were to throw a shadow of a doubt on something that they have done, and saying, I don't think this is quite, you know, three months later they've corrected it and brought back another one to listen to. Yeah, that's been dealt with. Um, it gets better and better. Um, I think that the other thing to bear in mind is that, like all digital things, it depends upon the resolution standards to which you're working. And if you're working to a sufficiently high sampling rate, um, <clears throat> it can be very good indeed. And certainly the one that we're working with is, is astonishingly good. So from someone so experienced, what are the future? What's to come next from analog circuitry design? Well, if everything's been done, what would I do next? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think everything has been done. Um, <clears throat> I think this whole question of um, pursuing perfection is something which will never finish. Um, if you're climbing a mountain, um, you start to climb this mountain and you look up and you see this peak above you, you say, boy, that would be great when I get to the top. When you get to the top, there's another mountain and you go on climbing and it's like that. Um, I can't tell you with any great degree of precision what the next step is going to be. I would like to see um, the buying public becoming sufficiently educated to appreciate the sound and to really understand that they can listen to um, a first-class recording and relax and enjoy it. I would like to play with the, uh, and I am playing with the harmonic structure of the sounds. Um, and we've designed a circuit which will invert the uh, sound structure. If you have a sound, a musical sound, a perfectly legitimate musical sound with uh, um, a certain amount of, say, third harmonic in it, um, <clears throat> then if you look at the waveform, um, there is a way in which you can, as it were, suck out that third harmonic, invert it, and feed it back in again, and that will make the sound subtly different. Um, you can change the structure of the uh, signal that we're examining and you've opened up a whole new possible chapter of sound um, manipulation, if you call it that. It's not all going to be good for a long chalk, 
but it's interesting and it can be done. If you like this video, subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel for all our latest video content. Also, you can find the magazine in your local newsagent, download the tablet edition, or find us online at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching.